So I, I want to thank Brenda and her team for putting on a great event. Um, this is my first time actually to be at the symposium. It's, I'm really quite impressed with uh, uh, just with the presentations, with the group here. It's just it's awesome to be part of this this group. Um, before I jump too far down the path, I'd like to get a better sense of who who you guys are and what you guys do. Um, if you will raise your hand if you are primarily an estate planning attorney, practicing estate planning attorney. Okay. Um, how many of you are primarily a practicing attorney of some other stripe? Okay. How many of you are realtors, practicing realtors primarily? Okay. Uh, financial advisors, CPAs, insurance advisors, probably a lot of overlap with the uh, financial. Um, what am I missing? Fiduciaries. Fiduciaries. Yeah. How many of you are, are fiduciaries? Now, of the fiduciaries, are you serving as uh, professional private fiduciaries here in Colorado, in California? Okay, gotcha, super. Okay, that's really helpful for me to understand. Um, I kind of got a, a bee in my bonnet a couple of years ago and I started really looking at the role of trust protectors. Um, as Val was talking about a lot of the strategies that get used in Medicaid qualification, Medi-Cal qualification, veterans benefits, and more along the lines of, of what I focus on, the, the high-end asset protection planning, irrevocable trust planning for tax purposes. We're dealing with trusts that either from inception are irrevocable trusts, or a lot of us, even in the, even in the foundational side of our estate planning practices, we're dealing with trusts that someday will become irrevocable and often may last for many, many years once the trust becomes irrevocable. And of course, one of, the, one of the questions always arises, well, once the trust becomes irrevocable, how do we get another shot at modifying that trust if circumstances change? And, and they will. They'll change dramatically. And we'll talk about some, some ways in which we've seen uh, the laws change and beneficiary circumstances change. And the role of the trust protector has evolved into what I believe is the most creative, most flexible, and frankly, most predictable and economical way to create mechanisms to allow irrevocable trusts to change when that's necessary. There are lots and lots of options, and we'll, we'll touch on a few of those. We can go through judicial modification actions in most jurisdictions. We can go through non-judicial um, modification actions if we can get the grantor or all the beneficiaries and all the beneficiaries to sign off on that. We can do trust decantings, but none of those are quite as efficient or quite as predictable as using a really good trust protector. And so we're going to talk about the role of protectors and how those have evolved over time. Um, now, Brenda told me that I can go until 4 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so that explains why you've got so many slides and the materials. We're going to be here a while. Um, in, in all seriousness, though, um, there are way more slides than I have any intention of covering. A lot of those are provided for your reference materials. I will refer to some of, the, some of that content as I'm as I'm talking this morning. So we're not going to go through all those slides. I have no intention of going through all those slides, but there's a lot of additional material like analysis of various cases around the country, analysis of various statutes. I've tried to include not only the citations, but also the full text of uh, various directed trust statutes around the country, trust protector statutes, model language. There's a bunch of stuff in there that I wanted you to have that we're not going to go over. So, so fear not. Um, but in, in all seriousness, how, what, how much time do I have? Do I have an hour? An hour, okay. All right. So we're going to talk about what the trust protector's role ought to be. We're going to look at the vision for what that trust protector can do. We're also going to look at, believe it or not, some of us practicing law really do care about what the law says. And also, we need to think about what the law doesn't say and where some of the opportunities might be in drafting and designing trust protectors. So the word bespoke, uh, I thought this was, I'm kind of a word guy, and so I thought this was pretty common knowledge, but the more I've talked to people, bespoke is, it's, it's kind of a bit of an arcane word. And it, it's really, it's an adjective that takes its origins from Great Britain, and it simply means something that is carefully tailored for a specific user. It's customized for a specific purpose. The opposite would be off the rack, off the shelf, mass produced, something like that. And the more I thought about and the more I learned about the role of trust protectors, the more I believe that this term really 
aptly describes how we should think about that trust protector's role. Because although a lot of our strategies will look very similar from one client to the next, it still needs to be, the, the trust itself and the role of the protector needs to be carefully tailored for the objectives that we're trying to accomplish on behalf of that client. Oops, wrong button. So let's talk about the trust protector's role. At its core, I believe that the role of the trust protector is to allow a trust to be modified over time when circumstances require. That might be due to a new tax code that happens to come out. Anybody remember January 1? Anybody remember uh, ATRA, the American Taxpayer Relief Act that President Obama signed in 2013? Um, the, law, the tax laws change, and they change dramatically, and spoiler alert, they're going to continue to change, um, especially in the context that, that I deal with a lot, which deals with the federal estate tax. We now have the highest estate tax exemption we've ever had, except for 2010 when we had no estate tax, and then it came roaring back. Um, we've got a, it's a $10 million exemption per person indexed for inflation. So that means that for decedents dying this year, they can pass a little over $11 million. It's actually $11,180,000 per taxpayer. They can pass that to whomever they want to aside from their surviving spouse. There's still an unlimited marital deduction. What that means is married couples can pass a little over $22 million to their heirs, to their beneficiaries, without having to pay any federal estate tax. And in California, we don't have a, se a separate state estate tax. So for a lot of people, the 2017 Tax Act made federal estate tax really a non-issue. However, if we look at what Mrs. Clinton was, was proposing and what Mr. Sanders were proposing in their tax, in their, their tax policies, we were within a hair's breadth of a very different tax policy coming into Washington with the 2016 election. Both Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Sanders were promoting a $3.5 million non-indexing exemption with a 55% tax rate. So a very, very different federal estate tax policy that came within just a hair's breadth of, of being the policy that, that drove forward. Now, if we, are, if we are looking at a potential blue wave in Congress in 2018 and a potential turnover of the White House in 2020, we could very well find ourselves with the 2017 Tax Act becoming obsolete well before its scheduled sunset. There is already a scheduled sunset on the current tax bill. It's going to completely evaporate in 2025, and we go all the way back to the $5 million index. We go right back to the pre-2017 law. My point in belaboring all of this is that not only will tax laws change, they will change dramatically. And the more we get polarized as a country, the more they're going to whipsaw back and forth, I think, in some pretty extreme ways. So we want to make sure that our irrevocable trusts can accommodate that. The other thing that we see an increasing use of trust protectors for is evolving laws in local jurisdictions, whether it's in California, whether it's in other states, state law changes dramatically. And it's not just in the jurisdiction where the trust is planted today. We may have a trust that exists in, Cal in California today, but it may move to another jurisdiction tomorrow. We need to not only understand what the laws are in our current state, but where the opportunities are opening up. And so if that trust is already irrevocable, we need to have a mechanism to make sure that we can move that trust to take advantage of some better laws in another jurisdiction. And of course, beneficiary circumstances change. Um, in, in two of my states where I practice, uh, both in Colorado and in Wyoming, we have a 1,000-year rule against perpetuities in each of those states, which means that you can create a trust today. It can be an irrevocable trust today. And if there's enough money, and if the trust is designed properly, the trust can last 1,000 years, so long as the money lasts. Other, there's other jurisdictions. South Dakota has no rule against perpetuities. The, the money can last indefinitely for generations upon generations. A thousand years is a very long time for a trust to be irrevocable. We, we, can't, we also have no idea 
what the next generation or the generation after that is going to be like. We have no op idea what their opportunities will be. We have no idea what their limitations will be, what disabilities they might have, what creditors they might have. We need to have a mechanism where we can go back and creatively adjust the trust over time to make sure that the realities inside this trust that has become irrevocable matches what tax law says, what the state laws opportunities open up, and what the beneficiary's needs are. So that's really the whole idea behind the role of a, a bespoke trust protector. And at the end of the day, it's important to understand, at least in, in my estimation, the role of the trust protector is to ensure that the set lawyer's wishes get carried out. The role of the trustee is to execute the trust on behalf of the uh, beneficiaries. Their, their duties are to carry out the trust for the benefit of the beneficiaries. The protector's role does not need to be the same. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what state law says and what some international law says about the role of the trust protector if we don't define that. But I would argue that if we will take the time to define the trust protector's role, that protector's duty should be to the set lore's intent and not to the beneficiaries. And, and so we actually have language um, available on our website if you want to use it that, that goes into tailoring that duty. In the context of elder law, as, as Val mentioned, and I, I think we see this really in all, in all contexts, it's very, it's very common for a set lore to name their adult child or their adult children to serve as the trustee of their trusts. In the context of elder law, especially when there are concerns about financial abuse, um, certainly we're not, gonna, we're not gonna appoint a beneficiary who, is, who we think may be prone to committing elder abuse. We'd never appoint them as a trustee, but we want to shield them from any kind of allegation by other children. If we've got, in Val's case, she's, she's one of three siblings. If she is serving as a trustee, we want to shield her from accusations from her siblings that she may be mismanaging funds. One of the roles of the trust protector could be to provide a backstop to that lay beneficiary, that benefit, that, I mean, that lay trustee, that beneficiary who's also serving as a trustee, to make sure that they've got some cover and some checks and balances, if you will, so they're beyond accusation. Um, the, and I guess the other, the other point I want to make in, in the context of elder law is that just like we talked about tax laws changing, benefits laws will change as well. And so if, the, if we have a trust that has become irrevocable and benefits laws change either foreclosing opportunities that we planned for or opening up new opportunities that we hadn't thought about, having a trust protector with the, with the power to strategically modify our trust to make sure it continues to comply with benefits laws can be another really good use of the protector without having to go through some judicial modification that's unpredictable. I see the protector as the keeper of the settlor's legacy. They're the ones who make sure that the settlor's intent gets carried out. Whether it's 20 years down the line, 200 years down the line, the, settlor, the protector's job is to carry out the wishes of the settlor, but in order for the protector to be able to do that, the protector has to be able to ascertain what the, settlor, what the settlor's intent was, which to my mind really argues in favor of statements of intent. How many of you uh, who are uh, practicing attorneys in this area routinely include letters of intent or statements of intent inside your trust instruments saying why we created this trust in the first place? A couple? Okay. Um, a couple of you may be napping as well, and that's okay. Um, I would really... Uh, um, and there are, there are kind of two different schools of thoughts on this. One of the schools of thought is to include the statement of intent inside the four corners of the trust instrument itself, to actually say as part of the trust instrument why we created this trust in the first place. The other school of thought is to set, have a separate letter of wishes that's not part of the trust instrument but accompanies the trust instructions for the fiduciaries, for the trust protectors, um, to carry out the settler's intent. There, again, I don't really care how you go about that. Some people are concerned that if it's inside the trust, does it, is it precatory language? Now is it binding language? Does some judge have review oversight over that? I don't know how the courts in California rule on that. 
I would simply encourage you that whether you do it inside the trust or separate from the trust, it makes a lot of sense to articulate why the set law created the trust as a long-term trust from the beginning. Because otherwise, if, if we're just doing a trust for the purpose of avoiding probate and we're simply trying to pass property outright to a beneficiary, we probably don't need a trust protector in the first, anyway. But if we've got long-term trusts where we are trying to protect beneficiaries from potential creditors, from outside predators that may seek to separate them from their inheritance, let's find some creative ways to actually say that whether it's in a separate letter of wishes or inside the four corners of the instrument. So then the protector and the trustee in reviewing that documentation understands why the trust was created in the first place. And there again, one of the slides at the very back provides some model language here. Now, when we, I guess another question, for those of you who are practicing attorneys, how many of you fairly routinely use trust protectors in your trusts? Okay, just a few. Um, another sh quick show of hands. How, so then how many of you who are practicing attorneys do not routinely use protectors? Okay, a few, okay. Um, California, as I think most practicing attorneys in this room uh, understand, California does not have a separate trust protector statute. Did not have a, does not have a directed trust law out there. Um, However, there's also no express prohibition in California law. But as we design the role of the trust protector, we need to understand what our state law allows. Whether or not you've got a directed trust statute, you need to understand that you've got a case from 1971, it's referenced in the materials, it's, it's broken down in your materials, that recognizes the role of the trust protector. But you also have to realize that you're not, I need to be careful here, because I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> it's not only important for you to understand the law of the jurisdiction where you happen to be sitting. You also, at least, at least in my opinion, and I'm the guy with the microphone, so it's my opinion that counts right now. Um, you, you should also understand what laws of other jurisdictions allow. Get a broader understanding, not only of the role of trust protectors specifically, but trust laws more generally and understand where the asset protection opportunities are, where the beneficiary, where, where it's a quiet trust statute, uh, where the protector's powers are most clearly defined. Because the trusts that you're designing right now for California residents, especially if they're revocable trusts, most of them are gonna be California trusts, at least at inception. But when that set law dies, if the beneficiaries are no longer California residents, if they're residents of somewhere else, why would we still bind that trust to be subject to California law? That trust may very well pick up and move to Wyoming, to Alaska, to South Dakota, to Nevada, to Delaware, to some other more attractive jurisdiction where there's no income tax. There's more flexible trust protector statutes. So as you're drafting, you have to be drafting with an eye towards the long view. You can't just be drafting for what you know today. You need to be drafting for what, what could come down the road. And, and with kids being more mobile than ever, those trusts that you're drafting now are going to move somewhere in, in some circumstance. So we need to be planning for that. So we also need to make sure that we understand as we're drafting protector powers, we should specify whether that power is held in a fiduciary capacity or not. And I'm gonna make the argument that I believe most powers that protectors hold are probably fiduciary powers. A couple of powers I'm not quite as confident about, but the other thing that we're gonna explore is that not all fiduciary duties are created equally. So we're gonna look at the difference, between, there's fiduciary and then there's fiduciary. So we're gonna talk about the distinction. So let's talk quickly about what the law says about protectors. There is a handful of US cases, and I broke most of them down in the materials for you. Again, this is one of the supplements at the back of the slide deck. Um, there is a long history, going back to the 1940s, um, of cases that recognize the existence of a third party who holds certain powers, bless you, um, holds certain powers inside the trust, they're not the trustee, 
they're not a beneficiary, they're not the settlor, they're some outside third party that holds these defined powers. In most of those early cases, it's in the context of voting closely held stock that happens to be owned by an irrevocable trust. And then reinvestment of sales proceeds, things like that. The spoiler alert here is that every single one of those cases, with the exception of one, every case called those power holders trust advisors, and in every circumstance, they were held to a fiduciary standard. They, the language that the courts used universally was that this is a quasi-trustee type role. And because it's a quasi-trustee type role, they're going to have fiduciary powers that are otherwise analogous to the duties that we, that we attach to a trustee. Uh, there is a case out there, uh, the McLean case, which is a very sad case. They had a trust protector used in there, but again, it was a fiduciary position uh, because the trust specifically said so. This is a quick uh, listing of the, stat of the states that have directed trust statutes. I'll explain that in a second. But states that are not part of, that, that have not yet enacted the Uniform Trust Code. And there's a quick caveat. Uh, two of those states, Utah and Michigan, did enact significant parts of the Uniform Trust Code, but they did not adopt the part concerning trust protectors. Now, when I say directed trust states or directed trust statutes, we're talking about a law in a state that says that we can break up the role of the trustee. And we can say that one trustee might simply be an administrative trustee and they hold uh, the records of the trust. They kind of create our, our tax situs, if you will, for where the trust is going to be, where the trust is going to reside. But they may simply be an administrative trustee. We may have another trustee who's an investment trustee and they oversee the investments and the assets inside that trust. And we may have yet another type of trustee that's a distribution trustee. And they don't hold records, they don't make investments, but they're the ones who make decisions concerning uh, distributions from the trust. That's what I mean when we have a directed trust statute. There are a lot of states out there that have enacted directed trust statutes that allow the set law to divvy up the, the various responsibilities of the trustee to create they, they do this for a lot of reasons. They do this for asset protection reasons. They might do it to elect into the laws of a, of a desirable jurisdiction. But that's what I mean when I say directed trust statutes. The directed trust, the states that have enacted directed trust statutes are also the ones that have generally led the way in recognizing the role of the trust protector or the trust advisor. The terminology gets a little bit muddy. In those states, you can have a third party who is given discrete powers they're not the trustee, but they, just, they, cert, they can just hold certain powers. And various states say that that is by default a fiduciary. Other states say by default it's not. Other states say the trust can make them a fiduciary. Others say that they're not a fiduciary unless the trust says so. It gets, it's all over the map. And there's a matrix in the back of the materials that breaks that down for you. But these are, I guess with, with some exceptions, these are also some of the more attractive asset protection jurisdictions. Um, Alaska has become a, a little bit softer on its protection. Colorado is a terrible option for um, asset protection. Delaware, of course, is a very attractive one. Nevada, we use Nevada a lot. Uh, South Dakota as well. I also use Wyoming, but Wyoming is among the UTC jurisdictions. Um, this is a map of the jurisdictions that have enacted major parts of the Uniform Trust Code. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about the difference here. This is also a list of the states that have taken their directed trust laws from the body of the Uniform Trust Code. And again, well, one of my jurisdictions, Wyoming, is on there. So let's talk about what the Model Uniform Trust Code provides as it relates to the role of the trust protector. The, again, there's a lot more analysis in the back of the materials here, but under the Model Uniform Trust Code, you can have this power holder and it doesn't matter what you call it, it's just a power holder. Um, and they are presumed to be a fiduciary. But that provision of the Uniform Trust Code is a default provision and it's not a mandatory provision, which means that the set law, through us as the drafting attorneys, can actually waive application of that fiduciary standard or what I would like to say is maybe more closely tailor that to the strategy. 
One of the, I guess, more vexing points of the Uniform Trust Code is that you know, there's, there's been kind of this nerdy dialogue among attorneys like me who um, argue that protectors and, you know, some people use the term protector. Some people use the term trust advisor. Some people say it doesn't really make a difference. Um, I kind of in the, I've kind of, I'm kind of in the camp that says it doesn't make a difference. It is what you want to call it. But understand that at least the Uniform Trust Code and a handful of jurisdictions notice a distinction between the, between the term trust protector and trust advisor. And just really quickly, the comments, and that's not in the body of the law. That's only in the comments of the Uniform Trust Code. The Uniform Trust Code provides that a protector is usually derived from offshore jurisdictions and connotes broader powers that you would not otherwise give to a trustee. Again, we'll, we'll look at some of these specifically, but things like powers to modify a trust agreement. You're not going to give the trustee the power to modify a trust agreement. Trust advisor is usually the term that denotes trustee-like powers. That's taken from the body of US domestic law. So understand that there is some, uh, a bit of kind of drafting schizophrenia out there with, within the Re Uniform Trust Code, within the body of statutes that say that protectors and advisors, at least conceptually in the law, are two different things. Now, I'm going to be very sloppy in my language because um, sometimes I'm going to use the term protector, sometimes I'm going to use the term advisor. I don't have very good discipline in, 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 in which term I'm going to use, but understand that the law sees these things as different beasts, although they come in under the same statutes. Now, trustee, the trusts may have multiple parties with powers to direct. Just as I was talking about, you could have a situs holder, you could have an administrative trustee, you could have an investment trustee, you can have a distribution trustee, you can have a trust protector, you can have a trust advisor, you can have a lot of different parties inside this trust, and that's fine. You need to clearly tailor the role for each of those in the context of the document. So one of the questions that, that I used to get a lot when I was answering legal questions and teaching this stuff uh, to, a, to a bunch of attorneys is, well, is a trust protector a fiduciary or are they not? And I think that that's actually not a, the right question to ask because it assumes that the fiduciary, non-fiduciary question is binary. It either is or it's not. It's either black or it's white. And that's not the case. Uh, one of the cases I rely on as I was uh, kind of evolving my thought on the role of protectors is actually a United States Supreme Court case from 1943 where Justice Frankfurter wrote that to say, and this is 1943, so it's very misogynistic language, but to say that a man is a fiduciary, to say that a person is a fiduciary um, only begins the analysis. It gives rise to further inquiry. If we, if we cross the threshold and say that somebody owes a duty to someone else, that only is the beginning of the analysis. We have to then go further and say, to whom is that person a fiduciary? To whom do they owe their duty? What obligations does that person have as a fiduciary to that person to whom the duty is owed? In what respect has that person failed to discharge those obligations? Where do they mess up? And then what are the consequences of breach? So we have to look, we, we can't just think of fiduciary, non-fiduciary as this black-white thing. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the trustee always, always, always has a fiduciary duty and their fiduciary duty always goes to the benefit of the beneficiaries. That's, the, that's fiduciary service 101. The trust protector, it's this new thing. We're still trying to figure out what this should be and how this, and how this thing should grow up. I'm going to make the argument that most powers are fiduciary powers, but we have to then look at Justice Frankfurter's analysis. Uh, Robert Kutcher, in his um, important treatise on business torts litigation, actually looks at the context of fiduciary as well. And he, said, he makes the argument that when one person holds a position of trust for another, does the protector not hold some position of trust for the set lore? When one party holds a position of trust for another, at a minimum, that party has a duty 
to act in the best interest of the person who has placed their trust in the party. And again, this is where I start to get my thought that the protector, as having been selected by or the mechanism created for the set lore, so the set lore is the one who created the role for the protector. The protector should serve the interests of the set lore. So instead of asking whether or not the protector is a fiduciary, I think we need to ask, why does the protector hold this particular power? And then who or what do they hold that power for? Did, do the, does the protector hold this power for the benefit of the beneficiaries, for the best interests of the beneficiaries, or for something else? So let's talk about a framework for third-party powers. And third-party powers, again, this is, this is the directed trust powers, whether we're talking about a trust advisor, a trust protector. Anytime we carve out some powers that we don't give to the trustee, that's a third-party power. There are powers that, by their nature, look like the kind of powers a trustee would hold. And so the, the body of case law in the United States, dating back to the 1940s, always called those quasi-trustee powers. Powers that look like a trustee's power, but we've given it to somebody else. And then uh, the term I like to use for this other flavor are these quasi-judicial powers, which, looks, which are the kind of powers that you would typically have to petition a court to exercise. Again, things like modification, distributions, stuff like that. So we have to look at the different kinds of powers that we give and then tailor the fiduciary standard accordingly. Quasi-trustee powers include things like advising or directing trustees' actions, things that are tied to the ordinary day-to-day -day operations of the trust, stuff that the trustee would otherwise do except that we gave it to somebody else. Those are quasi-trustee powers. And in every case in the United States, those powers were subject to a, a trustee's standard of care. If the advisor breached that power, breached that duty, then they were held to the same standard of care that the trustee was held to. So one of the points I would make is to the extent that we don't specify in our trust, or to the extent we specify that a power is a non-fiduciary power, if it looks like the kind of power a trustee would hold, the court's not gonna care what the trust says. The court's gonna say, that kind of power is a quasi-trustee power, and so we're gonna apply a trustee standard of care in the event of a breach. Matt. Yes, ma'am. Do you think it matters if the drafting attorney is serving as trust protector as to how the court will look at it? Yeah, so the question is, does it matter if the drafting attorney is serving as the protector and how the court will uh, construe that power? I think it absolutely does matter because as drafting attorneys, we always have a fiduciary duty to our clients to act in our client's best interests. So if I'm the drafting attorney and I name myself as trust protector, which I don't usually do, um, I can't give, I don't, I don't believe I can ever give myself a non-fiduciary power because I already have a fiduciary, fiduciary duty to my client. I don't know how I could ever exercise a power in a non-fiduciary capacity. This is just a quick list of, of powers that I think are quasi-trustee in nature. Again, they go to the day-to-day -day ordinary operations of the trust. Quasi-judicial powers are, again, some are probably fiduciary powers, some may be more questionable, but they are powers that are not inherently connected with the day-to-day -day trust administration. Things like adding or changing beneficial interests, deleting a beneficiary from a trust, adding a new beneficiary to a trust, granting powers of appointment to trigger a state tax inclusion to get a basis adjustment, as Val was talking about. Those kinds of things, you, those are not powers you would give to a trustee. There's no state statute out there that gives that power to a trustee. There are directed trust statutes that say you can give those powers to a third party, an advisor or protector, depending on what the statute says, but those are not compatible with a general trustee-like standard of care. Just a quick rundown of some of the things I think are probably quasi-judicial in nature. This does not mean they're non-fiduciary powers. 
This simply means they are different fiduciary powers with a different standard of care that attaches. So the list kind of continues here. As we think about documenting the trust protector's role in our trust instruments, you know, it can be really tempting, I guess, to do a couple of different things. One, it can be really tempting to just gloss over a lot of this kind of stuff and, and draft very broadly and say the protector can do whatever the heck the protector needs to do um, without a whole lot of detail in the interest of brevity. Um, I think that's a big mistake, for one. I think especially in a state like California that does not have a directed trust statute you can rely on, I think you have to go into great detail to outline what the protector can and cannot do and how they, how they exercise their powers. Um, but beyond, beyond designing the powers themselves, you should also, in my opinion, outline the circumstances under which they act. Do they, have a, do they act proactively or do they serve in more of a veto type capacity? Are there, what are the consequences if they act without having been asked to act? What are the consequences if they are asked to act but fail to do so or choose not to do so? The standard of care should be different. And again, this, we go into detail in the materials on, on what this looks like. Um, as a, a quick side note, before I forget, if you, if you want to download the sample language that we use in our trusts, I've made those available on our website. Um, if you just go to bespokeprotector.com, you can download the materials that we use. I mean, that's literally the stuff that we generally use in our trusts. So um, that, is, that is there for you to review and adapt as you choose. Now, again, a bit of a disclaimer on that, that is not tailored stuff. That's the stuff that, that's kind of the law, that's the whole stuff that we put in there. And we don't put all that stuff in every single trust. But I wanted to give you an opportunity to see how we draft specific powers and how we do indemnification and stuff like that. So, in Elder Docs and also in Wealth Docs, which is a product of Wealth Council, and these are um, drafting systems for um, elder law or estate planning attorneys, there is a preamble to the trust protector powers. Not only should you have a preamble to the trust or a statement of intent behind the trust, I believe you should also have a preamble to the article or part of the trust where you have a trust protector. It's one thing to say why we create a long-term trust in the first place. It's another thing to say, why did we give these powers to somebody who's not the trustee and not a beneficiary? So what is the role of this trust protector and what's our intent? So uh, just to kind of break apart the Elder Docs language, the, the, the bulk of which is included in the materials, the protector's function is to direct the trustee. Again, we're, we're pulling in our directed trust statute language there. The protector's function is to direct the trustee in matters concerning the trust and to assist if needed, and this is what's critical, in achieving our objectives. This is written from the perspective of the set lore of the trust. In achieving the set lore's objectives as manifested by the other provisions of our estate plans. Now that's, that's tricky as well. We, as, as lawyers, we know that every word, in fact, every punctuation point really matters. If, if the protector's role is to carry out the interests of the set law as manifested by the other provisions of our estate plans, that means we have to look holistically at the complete estate plan. It's not just as manifested by the other provisions of this document. We need to, it depends on how big this protector's role needs to be. If the trust protector is supposed to act holistically and act with this trust with an eye towards what else is going on in that client's life. That's what this language contemplates. And you'll see that that's, very, that that's common both in elder docs and also in wealth docs. But understand why that language is there and you start to understand the breadth of the protector's role. Now, the role of the protector and the powers that we give to protectors can be very wide ranging. They can be vast, potent powers. In order to minimize the likelihood that the protector's powers somehow get imputed back to the set lore in an asset protection context or to a beneficiary from an asset protection or a tax perspective, 
We want to have that trust protector be somebody who is not related to or subordinate to the set lore, the maker of the trust, or any beneficiary, or anyone who is a grantor, someone who has transferred property into that trust. And so there's a special code section that tailors how we can, how we can choose that. A couple of quick screen grabs. Um, this is a language that I put in my own personal Colorado flavored uh, revocable trust. Um, and this is, um, I wanna break this down really quickly because this was, I restated my trust last year uh, and Colorado just recently, I mean this session just adopted a new trust code that's, that's rooted in the uniform <laughs> trust code. But I go through the process in my trusts delineating the trust protector's powers. And I say that this is a fiduciary power. This is not a fiduciary power. But I want to make sure that if, this, if my trust or the trust that I draft for my clients ever get scrutinized by a court, that we have a statement right up front that says, I intentionally gave some powers as fiduciary powers and some powers as non-fiduciary powers. I'm opting out of state law to the extent I can. That's what this language does. Now, because the trust protector has the ability in a lot of trusts to modify the trust itself, what stops a protector from expanding their power? From saying, well, you know, you said it was a fiduciary power to do this, but I don't want to be held to a fiduciary standard, so I'm going to make that a non-fiduciary power. I make sure that we don't allow that inside our trusts because the trust protector's role is to carry out the set lore's intent. My role as the attorney is to look out for the best interests of my set lore. I'm not going to try to create some opportunity for the trust protector to backdoor my client's plan. So a trust protector cannot modify any power that's conferred in a fiduciary capacity in a way that softens that and makes it a non-fiduciary power. They can do it the other way. If it's a non-fiduciary power, they can flip it and make it fiduciary, but we can't, they can't undo a fiduciary duty. And this is one that I used in a Wyoming Domestic Asset Protection Trust as well. Very similar language. Um, the kind of powers that I routinely include in my trusts, I always include a power to amend. Because as we talked about at the very beginning, we have no idea what the law is going to provide, what the assets are going to require, what the beneficiary's needs are going to be. So the protector needs to have a power, in my opinion, to amend the trust. Changing the trust situs, holy cow, this is a big one. This is huge. I'm sorry, I love California, but you guys have some of the worst laws in the country, especially coming from my jurisdictions, you know, where libertarians rule. Um, you've got to create a mechanism to make it easy for the trust to pick up and move when it's time. Go to, let that trust move to Nevada. It's just right next door, zero income tax, strong asset protection, probably the strongest asset protection in the country. We use Nevada all the time. Um, but Alaska, South Dakota, Wyoming, don't do, don't do Florida. Lots of reasons not to do Florida. Um, but understand that the trust that you're creating today needs to have an opportunity to be somewhere else someday down the road. And settling disputes among the parties inside the trust. Is there any reason why we would elect to go to the court? to have some unpredictable outcome that requires everybody to lawyer up. If we can at least settle fairly minor disputes with an independent third party like a trust protector who understands advanced estate planning law and tax law and all the consequences that go along with that, let's create that mechanism to keep that out of the dockets at the courthouse. Uh, this is just sample language from the various trust systems out there. Um, more powers that I like to that I like to include adding and remove or adding trustees or removing trustees. If there's a vacancy that arises because we named uh, our favorite professional fiduciary in California and now she's retired or now she's moved somewhere else and she's not doing that anymore, well we've got a vacancy. Do we need to petition the court to get a new? Uh, trustee appointed? Do we need to get a majority or the, or the unanimous consent of the beneficiaries? Or can we simply have an independent third party select a trustee for the, to act? Essential, essential power. Um, 
one, one of the interesting ones that I came across was the, giving the trust protector the power to submit the trust for arbitration or mediation instead of having to go through a full adjudication of the courthouse. Now, in order to do that, the trust protector can't do that unless you say they can. So you have to give the trust protector standing by giving them that power inside the trust to say that they can submit the trust for mediation or arbitration or judicial review if necessary. This is some of the language that we like to use. This is what I've got. Um, this is actually, again, this is directly from the trust that I created for myself. So I mentioned I like the amendment power. I give an unlimited amendment power because who knows? I mean, in Colorado, in Colorado it can last a thousand years. So it's, we've got to have a really wide open amendment power. But I put in my trust that it is conferred in a fiduciary capacity, but only to the purposes and objectives of my estate plan. The protector owes no individual fiduciary duty to any beneficiary in the exercise or non-exercise of this power. And I, I put it right there in black and white because the law generally leans, to, leans toward fiduciary status of a protector. But as I mentioned with the 1943 case and with Mr. Kutcher's outline, we have to tailor the nature of that fiduciary duty. If we simply leave it as a fiduciary duty and we don't instruct the finder of fact, they're simply going to say, well, it's a fiduciary duty. Well, the best, thing we've, the best analog we've got for that is a trustee. We're going to say it's a trustee's duty of care. Therefore, it's in the best interest of the beneficiaries. I say, no, it's not. I specifically say it's for the benefit or for, for the intent of my trust. And as a quick, as a quick aside, I know we're winding down on time. This is not, I, I haven't created anything here. I've synthesized a bunch of other stuff, but this idea of creating a fiduciary duty, not to the beneficiaries, but to the purposes of the settlor's intent, that is rooted first in international law, uh, the law of the directed trust law of Belize specifically, and the Cook Islands specifically reference that. That has come ashore in the body of Michigan's law, Idaho's law, and Rhode Island's law as well. So there is a movement among US jurisdictions to identify a fiduciary duty to the purposes of the trust, not just to the beneficiaries. So we've got the ability to tailor, let's tailor. Um, and so this is again just my, my model tailored fiduciary language. It is no additional charge. You can use that anytime you want. Again, kind of back to some of the powers I like to use. I mentioned changing the governing law and the situs of the jurisdiction. Those are two different things. We don't have a chance to get into them right now. But we can pick up my trust and move it if we want to. And we will want to once I'm dead. Um, directing a trust decanting. Uh, just a quick rundown of what decanting allows. The idea behind trust decanting is simply that we've got a trust that has gone stale. It's just we've outgrown its purposes. And we need to really start over. Trust decanting simply allows a trustee to design a new trust and then pour over assets from the old trust into the new trust. Just like you would decant a bottle of wine, that's the idea behind trust decanting. But here, my trustee may be a family friend. They're not necessarily a really savvy estate planning professional, but my protector will be. So I give my protector the power to direct my trustee to do a trust decanting and guide that process. One of the questions that always arises is who has the power to appoint my trust protector and who can remove and replace my trust protector? Um, if you look at the vast majority of trusts I create, I've created this for myself, I've created this for my clients, I actually don't name a trust protector because hopefully I don't need a trust protector the day I do my trust. Hopefully it's pretty darn good when the client signs it. But it may not be good, it may not fit when the circumstances require it. 
So I create a mechanism to allow a protector to be appointed or to be removed or to be replaced. And we can do that any number of different ways. And I, I, I change it based on what the strategy requires. In my asset protection trust that I've got, I've, I have a Wyoming asset protection trust, I created a trustee appointment and removal and replacement committee and Val's on it. She probably doesn't even know. Um, but if a trust protector needs to be appointed, that committee, a majority of whom are always independent and non-subordinate to me, they can appoint a protector who meets the certain criteria. They can also remove or replace that protector. I also, for a lot of clients, I as the attorney drafting it, will reserve to my law firm the power to appoint, remove, and replace a protector. My law firm won't generally serve unless the client specifically asks me to, in which case we've got to run the ethics and all that, um, which I may get a chance to touch on. But I say that a, we're a partnership, so I say that a, a partner in the law firm of Evergreen Legacy Planning or its successor in interest, in case we sell, um, can appoint a protector in the, in the event one is needed or remove or replace or whatever. I don't name myself individually because who knows what I'm doing in 25 years or 50 years or a thousand years when all this stuff matters. I want to create a mechanism that's going to outlive the individuals that we name inside this trust. Um, one of the, I guess, yes, this is, this is actually what I was talking about. In, in my, in my um, Wyoming Asset Protection Trust, my law partner, who's also a very good friend of mine, Jonathan Mintz, and his wife, Val, and my wife, Megan, comprise this committee who can remove and replace and appoint protectors. The majority of, and it's my language, my failsafe here says that the majority must always be independent. And if for some reason one of them is unable and it's no longer majority, the, the committee can't act. There's my protector designator language as well. The protector cannot exercise powers for its own interest. If the protector changes situs, directs a trust decanting, or otherwise drains a trust in the favor of another trust, we've got to leave adequate assets behind to, wipe, to wind down that trust. Um, just in the interest of time, I want to let me touch on one more thing. We go, we go into a whole lot of stuff on um, how we tailor powers. One of the things I would encourage you to not do is don't ever require that a court of competent jurisdiction remove and replace a protector. Um, you'll see in some drafting systems that actually is the recommended or preferred model. I actually think that that, I've come to think that that's probably not the best plan. Um, I think that there are a lot better options as far as who can remove and replace. I think that you as, a law, you as an attorney, you as a fiduciary, you as a professional who knows this industry are much better suited to select somebody who can serve as protector than a court can. Um, and once you submit a matter to the court for adjudication, it's really hard to pull it, right back, it's pull it, to pull it back out and not have continuing court oversight. Um, so one of, the, one of the challenges that we run into when we're drafting for trusts is um, create, always having an eye towards a mechanism that allows efficient administration. We don't want to give, uh, we, we don't want to name individuals as much as we can name entities or create mechanisms. We don't ever want to submit to court adjudication if we don't have to. We don't want to give beneficiaries powers to control people who can modify trusts. Um, so always be thinking with an eye towards asset protection and towards flexibility. So with that, I, th I think, am I out of time? Am I out of time? A couple more minutes. Um, so I, I kind of had to fly through a bunch of stuff there. Um, what questions do you guys have about the role of protectors? What a miss that, that you really want to dig in on? Brenda. If you were going to do a committee mm -hmm. to um, be able to appoint, um, if you don't necessarily have an entity to refer to in that committee, and you do have a very long trust, what would be your recommendation for handling that? 
Um, so in, in the case of having a committee mechanism like that, what I would like to do is have, whether it's your law firm or whether it's a successor in interest to your law firm, that law firm could appoint uh, members of a committee comprised of a specific class. Maybe it's a class of beneficiaries. Maybe it's a class, because at, the, at that point, once the trust is being administered, you can have beneficiaries who serve on committee, serving by majority, to then appoint or remove or replace. They do not have to be non-adverse at that point. That's correct. But again, if you simply name Brenda Geiger as the person who can then appoint that committee, what happens when you retire? Um, create some mechanism that says that a partner or a shareholder in my firm or its successor or whatever can appoint a committee comprised of individuals who meet this qualification who then appoint a protector. Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, how about having a, a corporate fiduciary, a, a bank, trust department, or something like that, either serve as a protector or serve as the party who can appoint or remove, replace a protector? Um, I think there are a couple of challenges with that. One, I've, I've had a hard time finding traditional financial institutions, whether it's a, a bank or a trust department, be willing to hold that power because they don't understand um, what the protector can and cannot do, and it's also not covered by their liability insurance. You're gonna to have to have specifically designed E&O insurance to serve as a trust protector in that context. Um, the other side of it, too, is that if, if that corporate fiduciary is also serving as the trustee, or even as a trustee, um, maybe they're the investment trustee in a directed trust, you're now asking that trustee to appoint someone who has the power to remove and replace that trustee in that context. And so it creates a conflict for that, for that trust company to be able to do that. Um, I have come across a few CPAs who are willing to serve in that capacity. I've come across a few independent financial advisors who are able to do that, but you've got a lot of compliance issues as to whether or not they're, in this case, maybe their broker dealer won't allow them to serve in that capacity. Um, my, my personal preference is I always like to use experienced estate planning attorneys um, who understand a lot of, have got a lot of sophistication in their planning model um, to be the ones who actually will serve as a protector or also to be ones who can appoint or select that trust protector simply because the protector's role is um, very new in the United States and we're just now starting the smart drafting around how we design this trust protector's role. There are a lot of legal questions yet to be answered in the context of trust protectors. And so um, most people who haven't done a lot of digging on this aren't really willing to serve that or they're kind of doing it capriciously saying, oh sure, yeah, I'll do it, but it's, everything's a non-fiduciary capacity. It's not gonna work. Uh, the courts aren't gonna let that happen and it's, it's just not going to work. That does get to another question though um, about who, who can serve, who, sh who should serve as a trust protector. If you think about the powers that you're giving this protector, powers to modify the trust document, powers to delete a beneficiary, powers that can cause estate tax inclusion by granting a power of appointment over specific assets or over entire trust shares. These are extremely sophisticated powers that somebody would hold. If it's just Uncle Joe who's holding that power, it's going to be hard to get Uncle Joe to understand the consequences of exercising or not exercising that power. And Uncle Joe's not going to have you know insurance. Now, I've heard somebody argue, well, you know, you give that power to Uncle Joe, he doesn't act, nobody's going to sue Uncle Joe. That's true until it's not true. Um, if Uncle Joe makes a mistake and he fails to give, a, he, let's, say that, let's say that it makes all the sense in the world for Uncle Joe to grant a general power appointment over this highly appreciated asset. We got Bitcoin in our estate, somebody who bought it in 2010 when it was like 30 cents. And now it's gone up, I haven't checked it today, but it's, it was trading around 8,300 yesterday. So a lot of gain, all this appreciation and gain. And we've got this sitting inside this trust. 
if Uncle Joe grants a testamentary power appointment to a beneficiary who's knocking on death's door over our highly appreciated Bitcoin, then that person dies, that Bitcoin is in their estate, we get a step up in basis to today's market value, all that gain gets wiped out, never to be taxed at the federal or state level. In California, that could be up to 13.3% at the state level, 20% at the federal level. So now you just saved 33% of all that value by grant, if we could grant that power. But Uncle Joe doesn't get around to it. He doesn't sign the paperwork because he's out playing golf, he's out fishing, whatever. And you know the person that we could have given that power to has now died. Well, Joe, Joe, you should have been paying attention. You were the trust protector. Why didn't you do that? Well, I didn't understand it. You know, nobody told me. I didn't really get it. Um, that's why I like to have somebody who understands what they're doing serve as the trust protector. I also like that not to be a family member because these are complicated decisions with severe consequences. If something goes sideways, I don't want that to be the conversation at Thanksgiving dinner. I want, I want the family to be family. I want the trust decision makers to be non-family, sophisticated professionals who know what they're doing. So, and they're held, and they're insured, and they're compensated for their services. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, I'll, I will be around. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, this is a rapidly evolving area of the law. It's fascinating. Um, love to answer any questions that you got throughout the course of the day. Thanks a lot.